My name is Steven Jones, and I love J. Ross TV. What's up, y'all? This your boy J. Ross hanging out with the man himself, man, Mr. Steven R. Jones. This cat here, man, when y'all see his resume and credentials and the things he's <laughs> accomplished and done in his life, but me, you know, y'all know I'm from the hood, so I don't know what he do. Say, so, hey, Steven, what, what is it? What's your title, man? I am technically a lighting director and a production stage manager. Man, but you've, you've done it for 40 years? Yeah, for 41 years. 41 years. Yes, sir. So yeah. can you tell us, like, what the experience was like from your youth until your, your retirement, you know? Yeah, well, I tell you, man, you know, I started my father, the late Aaron A. Smith, who was an educator. Uh -huh. As a matter of fact, he was one of the first black male principals in the state of Flint, Michigan. Man. And uh, he made sure all of his kids got an education, and he kind of picked theater for some reason for me. And you know, I... I don't understand why he did that, <laughs> but I sure enough love my daddy for doing it because it has sustained me, you know, all of my life. Man. You know? And uh, like I said, when I was 11 years old, he had me going to junior theaters on Saturday, you know, painting, making props, and, you know, doing the lighting and all that stuff, you know, which I kind of like, but, you know, as 11, man, you want to be outside playing. Yes, <laughs> you want to be watching the cartoons, you know. Yes, sir. But uh, I, I, pre I appreciated it later in life. And when I uh, graduated from high school, I went to Eastern Washington University on a football scholarship and uh, played football out there. And, um, but they had a really wonderful theater program. There's a man named uh, Professor Bollinger mm -hmm. who took a liking to me and became my mentor. And the thing about Professor Bollinger is that he was one of these Heinz 57 guys. He was a painter, uh, he built furniture, he did lighting, he did sound, and he basically just handed everything over to me and I picked up on the lighting, lighting part of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, graduated from there, was one of the first and only blacks at that time to graduate from Eastern Washington University in a four-year program Man. in theater arts management and design. Man. And from there I went to San Diego State University where I hooked up with uh, Dr. Bellingary, uh, who was my mentor there. And um, I, it was just one of those things, you know, that God does for you, you know, he puts you in places, you know. And um, <clears throat> Dr. Bellingary was my savior there. I mean, he got me through that uh, two and a half year program because there was no blacks in that program. <clears throat> and the treatment that I was getting from the department wasn't fair. You know, they, uh, we had a graduate lab that uh, we were supposed to use as graduate students. And I'm a graduate student. And uh, the head of the department came by, Dr. Pyle, and asked me why was I in the graduate lab working. And I said, well, it's the graduate lab is where he says, yes, you're a graduate student, but you're a graduate student and your assistantship is in dance, the theater next door. So you shouldn't be in this room working, doing anything. He says, give me your keys. And I gave him my keys and I left. And really, hurt and disappointed. I called my dad. I said, Dad, you know, I don't know what's going on here, but, you know, these people ain't treating me right. He said, what do you need? I said, I need a drafting table. I need to be able to do my work, you know, because we're drawing designs and, you know, to scale and, you know, I need a drafting table. And so my father said, don't worry, son. Call me tomorrow. I called my father the next day. He said, go downtown to this drafting store. I called him already. They'll be looking for you, pick out what you need, and they'll deliver it to the house. So I had my own drafting, Muto drafting Japanese table <laughs> in my crib. Yeah. <laughs> so I could sit there and drink and do my work and, and do it on my time. Right, right. So that was a huge plus uh, for me there. And uh, Dr. Merle Leslie was this 
incredible genius when it came to technology. And um, we were part of a beta testing program for a company called Strand Century. Strand Century built the first lighting computer. <clears throat> And it was beta tested at San Diego State University. And I was part of that beta testing team to work on that computer. Mm -hmm. And basically what they did was free labor. Because <laughs> we're college kids and we got ideas and they said, here, here's the, here's the computer. Y'all make it do what you want it to do. Mm -hmm. And you know, tell it you know, the things that you'd like to see it do. And so we put all kind of holes and weights and things, timeline in terms of the lighting developing and stuff on stage. And, and uh, so I was part of that team. Right. Now, little did I know how important that was going to be later on in my professional life. But when I graduated from there, my sister had a really good friend that was L.D. Lewis. He's a wonderful tap dancer, Broadway tap dancer. He said... Um, Tell your brother to come to New York. He says he's going to do fine. Here. So I have graduated from San Diego State. I packed up my stuff, came back to Michigan for a couple of days, and then moved to New York. I slept on the LD floor for a couple of months, you know, just trying to find my way, trying to feel my way through, you know, a young black man, you know, with credentials. Some people didn't, you know, it was kind of leery of me and kind of uh, felt intimidated, <laughs> you know, because so he's a little young black kid, you know, 22 years old with a master's degree in production from San Diego State University. Mm -hmm. So who the hell you think you are? <laughs> you right. know? Well, um, you know, hey, don't hate on me because, you know, I went and, you know, did what I was supposed to do. I mean, this is what you're supposed to do, right? I mean, go to school, get an education and and then get out here and start working. Yeah. And so uh, I was introduced to uh, the Harlem Cultural Council, which was Jeannie Faulkner and Emory Taylor. They had a thing called the Dance Mobile. And they did dance, they, what, they took dance all around New York. And every fall, every winter, we would have a big uh, dance festival at a place called Symphony Space on 96th Street in New York. And uh, I became their lighting director for that program. And out of that came this flourishing amount of work because everybody's like, Yo, who is this dude? Who is this young black dude doing lights? I mean, this cat know what he's doing. Mm -hmm. And so I became the light designer for Rod Rogers Dance Company, the Ned Beard Contemporary Dance Theater, Elio Pomari, uh, Fred Benjamin, um, <laughs> Nikki, uh, Walter Nix, all of these wonderful choreographers in New York, man. And I became their number one guy. And we were working so much, man, I had to get a team of girls and pe production people together to help me work with all these companies because it was just a little bit overwhelming. Mm. And uh, <clears throat> I got so good at it uh, that I got recognized uh, by a lady named Mickey Shepard at the Brooklyn Academy of Music out in BAM, they called it BAM. And uh, they were doing this thing called Dance Black America. And um, I came there with Rod Rogers to do this piece called Box. So it was a dance piece about a black man in a jail cell. And I created this white light jail cell with these bars in it for him to dance into. And it was really, really cool, man, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and so this is, this is the hook. So I come in there with Rod Rogers. I go upstairs to the lighting console. I tell the guy, you know, because everybody brought their own designer. It's like about 30 different dancers. So I was Rod's, Rod's designer. And so he says, look, uh, son, we get ready to go on break. Um, here's the manual to the board. When I come back, we'll program. And I said, okay. And so he left, went to lunch, came back an hour later. 
He says, uh -huh. okay, son, did you read a little bit? Did you understand anything? Uh -huh. I said, yeah, I'm very, I'm, we're good. He said, well, what, do you, what do you want me to do? I just want to hit you hit the go button. He said, what do you mean by that? He said, I, said, I programmed the lights. He says, that's impossible. I just came to do the manual. I said, you see this manual here? You see these 10 pages? I wrote those. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> what? He said, you come with me. He took me downstairs. He says, I don't know who this young man is, but whoever he is, y'all need to hire him. Because he's the only one that knows how to work this board. And he's done things with this board I don't even, didn't even know what to do. Mm, mm, mm. <laughs> yes, sir. So from all of that came this man named Douglas Gray. <clears throat> Douglas Gray was Harry Belafonte's production manager. He called Bam, because we had a friend there named Sarah. Sarah and I were really good friends, and he said, Sarah, tell me about this black lighting guy y'all got at the theater. Is he really all of that? Is he? She said, he's a wonderful dude, Doug. You should call him. Doug called me and said, look, I'm Doug Gray, I'm the tour manager for Harry Potter Farm, and we're looking to take a light designer out on the, on the road. Um, would you, you know, like to come in for an interview? Yes. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> so I went down to, uh, to, I met Doug at the Belafonte Enterprises. We talked. He said, look, man, you're perfect for the job. He says, I'm good with you, but you got Mr. Belafonte's got a he's the final say. So he says, he'll be here in a few minutes and when he gets here. So Harry walks in and looks at me and he says, So you the new hot hot stuff in town, huh? I said, Well Mr. Belafonte, I don't know about all of that, but you know, I you know, I'm a lighting guy, you know, that's so I got a degree and I know what to do. He says, Okay. He says, Look. They'll give him a three-month contract. Let's see how it does. If it works out, we'll keep it. So this is where my life and story gets to be a little on the crazy side. <laughs> but this just shows you how God works. Right. So now, I've never really been a big fan of Harry Belafonte. I knew who he was. I knew about his music. You know, but I wasn't, didn't follow him at all. But... When I was in the fifth grade, my, my father sent me and my sister to spend the summer with my uncle. This would have been around early, late, uh, 68, 69. Keep your head to the sky had just come out. Because we went and saw Earth, Wind and Fire uh, that one night. And uh, we didn't stay long because they started smoking and my uncle wasn't having that, so we had to leave. Two nights later, he says, put on your dress clothes, we're going to Heinz Hall, which is a very you know, prestigious theater in, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Heinz, the Heinz family, mm -hmm. Heinz Ketchup. Right. So I said, well, who are we going to see? He said, we're going to go see Harry Belafonte. Harry Belafonte, who is he? <laughs> so here I am in fifth grade, got my little suit and tie on. I want to go see Harry Belafonte. And I tell you, man, when they started singing those songs, and, and uh, especially Hole in the Bucket, <laughs> you know, I fell right in. I said, oh, man, this dude, I like this guy, you know. So fast forward to me going in 1968 to see Harry Belafonte. 1979, I'm graduating from Eastern Washington University. Uh, my family is so excited. Everybody flies out to Washington. We had a big family gathering. We did the graduation, and the next day, my father had a big dinner party for me. And he says, after the dinner party, we're going to go to the Opera House in Spokane. We're going to go see a show. So who the fuck that? He said, Harry Belafonte. <laughs> like Harry Belafonte? <laughs> so here I am at the Opera House, where I also uh, did, uh, did my intern stuff at, when I was at Eastern Washington University. 
And, uh, and we saw the show, man, and it was cool. So now, fast forward, I'm hired by Harry Belafonte to do three months on tour. I get the tour schedule. And I look at the tour schedule. And the first stop is where? Spokane, Washington. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Steve, when you design those lights and you, you're doing it uh, this weekend, what does the creativity part inside of your mind come from? Is it like you just pull stuff out you've seen on TV back when you were growing up, or you can see colors now and and you can incorporate it into your light design? Well, see, that's the magic of the whole thing about theater and creativity. You can only draw from what you know and what you have, you know, learned over the years. Uh -huh. You know, I. Uh, Having had the training that I had, and it's just, I, I, I benefit from two situations. The book school stuff, what the books say, the measurements of light and light level and all of that stuff, and then the practical stuff that you do, that you learn and you see, and the mistakes that you make. Over Through experience. Years. Yeah. 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 So I mean, after 41 years, uh, <laughs> so you know what you know what's popping. All I need to do is just tell me what song we're playing, <laughs> and I got you covered. Yeah. All I need is a few, you know, basic things. Like I went in. Um, I've been listening to Michael McDonald's songs all week, and um, I got the we got the layout of how the band's going to be on stage. Mm -hmm. And then what I do is I go in and I create band specials so that I can highlight everybody in the band. But then I create all this atmosphere around me. And the thing for me is that you have to know color. And you have to know the science of color. Because certain colors do certain things for people's eyes. And certain colors, you know, represent certain things in people's minds. Mm. So you really have to have had the studying of light and color to to understand what it is that I do. And what I do, I don't think, you know, we got a lot of lighting people out there, but ain't nobody doing it the way that I do mm -hmm. because I'm doing it from a scientific perspective. Yeah. In terms of, I call sometimes, I call myself, in another world, an optical, optical, optical engineer because I'm, I'm, I'm putting information out on the stage, I'm painting pictures on the stage that registers in people's heads and in their minds of what they see. Because the color does certain things to your pupils and all of that stuff. And if you didn't study that stuff, Man. You, you don't know. So can color affect your mood? Can uh -huh. you, like when you design in life, you can affect a person's mood on a particular mm -hmm. song? Mm -hmm. just, just like music can. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah? yeah. All Man. that stuff is, is in there. But, you know, what I try to do is I try to just paint pretty pictures that represent the sound of what the music is saying and, and how it's being played. You know, if it's really high and loud and crazy, then maybe I'll do some red, amber, and some yellow or something like that. Mm -hmm. If it's subdued and cool and calm and cool down, maybe I'll do some, some light blue or some... <laughs> Midnight blue with a little green streak of green in there. Yeah. So like when you watching TV at home, sometimes I see shows, you be like, "Oh man, that wasn't right. Why they do that?" I, sometimes <laughs> I have a hard time watching these shows. For real. These, all these guys do, they just turn this shit up. They just turn yeah. the lights on, you know. And uh, and it, it really doesn't have anything to do with what the song is doing. Yeah. It's, you know, you shouldn't be. There's no competition between the lights and the music is supposed to really go together. Man, okay. You know, it's a, yeah, so that's why, you know, when you do your lighting and you do your plots and you do your plans, that you really, you know, have to have things laid out in such a way where, you know, it's measurements. I mean, it really has strategically where the light is and where the light is going to be focused and how the light's going to be focused. Cause you have a series of different lights that do different things. There are over 45, 50, 60 types of lighting instruments, and they all do something different. Mm -hmm. So you got to find, especially in today's world, because now we have all this intelligent lighting that 
it's great. It's a great tool, but it's so much time consuming because you have to tell the light what to do, to tell it where to go, to tell it what color to be in. You have to tell it the, the lens, the zoom, and how big, how small you want the circle to be. And all that is fine and good, but man, you got to have time. To, it takes time to do that. You mm. just can't say, hey, okay, let's turn this on. You know, like you used to do with these these regular units, you know, that we're using this weekend. If we had intelligent lighting on this show, I wouldn't have time to talk to you. I'd like, be too busy trying to program it. Mm. But in this case, you know, we got a basic good lighting package in there. Show will look good, and I'll be able to control everything manually. You know, because when you do shows like this, where there's not, it's not a touring show, it's not something that you do every day, you're going to step in there and you're just going to do it. You got to be able to have manual control and feel what you're doing in order to make it work. And that's what I'm really good at. <laughs> Man. So what's up next for you? What you got? I know you're retired now. You are thinking about coming out and... Uh, well, I tell you, uh, me and Brian Owens have a really wonderful relationship. He's a good guy. Yeah, I met him back in New York when he was working on a thing up in New York at the Apollo Theater where I was the uh, production uh, manager there for 15 years. Yes, sir. And I built a space on the third floor called the uh, Music Cafe. And we would have, every weekend, we'd have the young artists come up there and there and, you know, show us what they have. And he came up one weekend and uh, what I do with all the groups that come through there, I listen to the sound check make sure that the levels are right, you know, and, uh, and, and get a chance to meet them. And uh, he has such a wonderful voice. I was like, hey man, can you, uh, you know any Marvin Gaye? <laughs> he said, uh, yeah. He said, as a matter of fact, I just came back from Japan doing a whole Marvin Gaye tribute. I said, will you mind singing some of that for me? Man, this brother started singing that Marvin Gaye. I said, oh my God. This is the first and the only person that I know that comes anywhere near close to what Marvin sounded like. Man. He sounded like a young Marvin. Man. And I was just so happy because, you know, Marvin was... Working with Marvin was, was tough, you know, especially in the, in the later end of his career, you know because of the drugs and everything. And uh, it was hard to get him on stage, but once he got on stage, it was hard to get him off the stage. <laughs> and, you know, his music was, his timeless, his stuff was, what he did in the studio with music, man, nobody else has been able to, to repeat, because he's, all that layering of his voice, and all those oohs and ahs and, and all of that, man, it's incredible, man. So this, Brian's got it though. Mm -hmm. Brian's got it. And so I'm, I'm happy to be working with him. So we're gonna, you know, we're gonna do, I'll be back here every once in a while to do some training and do some projects with Pearl Kids. My whole thing now is really about uh, teaching and really about giving back <coughs> because of the many years that I have had uh, doing what I do, you know. Uh, you you got to give back especially to these the young black men and women who all they know is standing and, you know, they want to be rappers, they want to be in front, you know. They don't realize the, the lucrative business that it is behind the scenes. It's, it's, without, without the production, <coughs> you ain't got no show. Right. <laughs> you know, you can sing all you want to, but if ain't somebody ain't doing the microphone and somebody ain't turning on the lights, man, you ain't got nothing, mm -hmm. you know. You need a serious production person in order to make your stuff pop. Yeah. Hey, now what's the craziest lighting design you have ever had to come up with? <laughs> I think one of the craziest things I've done is um, I did a uh, I did a Christmas party for um, for um, God, what's the name of it? Oh. It's my age now, folks. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, God. Why can't I remember this guy's name? He's a famous fashion designer in New York. Oh. Uh, Tommy Hilfiger. 
<laughs> oh, okay. And he had a huge Christmas party. And he had these dancers and he had this music and we utilized all of the Apollo, man. So I just want you to light it up, Jones, and make it look festive. And man, we had balloons, we had confetti cannons going off, man. We had all kind of stuff going on. But <clears throat> when you're working for people like that, and the thing about it is, what I do is expensive. You know, the equipment is expensive. So you got to have some budget, you know, if we don't work together, because I don't work on the cheap. You mm -hmm. know, I use real, you know, first class equipment because I don't have time for stuff to be breaking down in the middle of the show. I ain't got time to be trying to fix nobody's mess. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when I order stuff, it comes in right, it comes in at a, at, a, at a high number, but you know it's going to work. Right. You know, and that's the problem with some of these shows I hear now. Because everybody's trying to do stuff on the cheap, you know. Well, can you make it look like this? Well, yeah, but you got to pay for that. <laughs> you, know, I mean, you don't get this, you know, you can't get this for, you know, on the cheap, my man, you know. These lights cost money, and you got to have time, you know. So that's something that people, a lot of people in the industry, you know, don't, don't understand that what we do takes time. Hey, all right. Hey, y'all, this Hanging out with Steve, man. We just chilling in the loop, and uh, it's getting a little late. And uh, but man, got so much information, man. He has so much more. You can check him out, and uh, you'll see him. You'll see, you'll see his work yeah, Sunday, Sunday. You know, so mm -hmm. when you see him, you know, pat him on the back, show him some St. Louis love for doing a great job. This your boy Jay Ross hanging out in St. Louis with my guy Steve Jones, y'all. I'm gonna let y'all bounce. We 10 million strong, and we gone. Peace.